In the early 1930s, in the prelude to World War II, the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy needed production engines that could meet or exceed the one horsepower per cubic inch benchmark. At the time, that power output had only been achieved by several purpose-built racing engines, but no reproducible production engine had yet fulfilled this need. As a result, the U.S. government financed several high-performance or hyper-engine projects, and in today's video, we'll be taking a look at some of these incredible, forgotten pieces of engineering. On May 23, 1940, the Chrysler Company, wanting to assist the U.S. government's military preparedness program, embarked on what would be a very expensive engine development program that would ultimately fail to deliver. At the time, the idea was to develop a hyper-engine that would be a liquid-cooled monstrosity that generated over 2,000 horsepower. The XI-2220, as it would become known, was designed as an inverted V-type 16-cylinder engine with a center drive reduction gear. Realizing the necessity of maintaining a small frontal area for optimum aerodynamics, the engine's front section fit within a 34-inch diameter circle. After creating a test engine in the early 1940s and beginning work on a single-cylinder testbed, the Air Force expressed interest on April 14, 1941, and the engine program was given a contract for $720,000. Testing on the first twin-cylinder engine started on August 12, 1941, and evaluation of the connecting rods, bearings, cylinder heads, and barrels was started. However, before they could design a full-sized engine, the contract was amended, noting the need for a fluid coupling, for a supercharger drive, an axial-type coolant pump, and a radial-type supercharger in addition to the axial variant. The resulting change resulted in a contract price of $1.2 million, and the resulting full-sized multi-cylinder engine was finished on July 30, 1942. In this first variant, the engine itself was complete. However, the rear gear case, which included the rear supercharger and the accessory gear case, hadn't yet been finished and as such, the rear section was just a mock-up. Unfortunately for the XI-2220, tests were paused on September 19, 1942 because of the destruction of the crankcase when a rod bearing seized and the rod broke, going through the side of the crankcase. However, soon multi-cylinder engine number one was rebuilt and testing resumed on October 22, 1942. On January 6, 1943, a meeting was held in Detroit, which was attended by General K.B. Wolfe, General F.O. Carroll, and Colonel E.R. Page, with the express purpose of reviewing work on the XI-2220 contract. By the end of the meeting, they instructed the Chrysler Corporation to design a two-stage, two-speed supercharger and to submit a program for building 100 full-sized engines. This new demand was a tall order. The work outlined for the addition of a two-stage supercharger required considerable revision. In addition, the new critical altitude was to be designed for 25,000 feet, and the lubrication, coolant, and electrical systems needed to be redesigned so they would remain functional at 40,000 feet. As progress on the project continued, the cost of the project ballooned to $13.3 million, which, corrected for inflation, would be nearly a quarter billion today. As work continued, so did the scope and complexity of the project, such as the design and development of the axial supercharger, testing of a fuel injection system, and finishing the two-stage supercharger system. However, soon more fatigue issues began cropping up. On June 19, 1943, engine number 3 operated for over 4 minutes at 2,000 actual brake horsepower and nearly 4.5 hours above 1,850. Callum Douglas, in his book The Secret Horsepower Race, points out the similarities between the Chrysler V16 hyperengine and the German V12s, which the Chrysler Corporation had been studying since the start of the war. The crankcase was visually identical to the UMO211, and the supercharger had hydraulic coupling similar to the DB601. Also, it was inverted, like both of them. Where Chrysler went wrong, Douglas states, was when they committed to only fitting the engine with two valves per cylinder, rather than four. This crippled the output of the engine, which could, due to its low running temperatures, have capitalized on a higher power density. Another thing that eventually doomed the project was the mid-project redesign that would include a two-stage supercharger, which cost the project valuable time they couldn't afford. Interestingly, George Hubner, head of the IV2220 program, later designed the company's V8 automobile engines, including the Chrysler Hemi engines, culminating in one of the ultimate muscle car engines, the awesome 426 Hemi. These hemispherical auto-engine combustion chambers were a direct descendant of the IV-2220s. I remember wondering when I learned that most general aviation aircraft were powered by either Continental or Lycoming engines. Where were these manufacturers during World War II? Why weren't there P-51s powered by giant Lycomings? Well, the answer to that question is long and complex, but for today's video, we are highlighting one of Lycoming's final attempts at creating the most hyper 
Hyper Engine ever created. The XR7755. Yes, that's 7,755 cubic inches. Design work on the 7755 started in earnest in 1943, and the Ultimate design featured 36 cylinders, each using 6.375 inch bore and 6 and 3 quarters inch stroke. Oriented in four rows of nine cylinders, air cooling would be nearly impossible, so they decided the engine would be liquid cooled. Interestingly, the overhead camshaft featured two sets of cam lobes that could be shifted in flight to optimize power or economy, which might sound familiar, and it should because that means that this giant radial was a VTEC. Like the XI2220, this engine also unfortunately used only two valves per cylinder, which would limit the power density it was ultimately capable of. Inside the engine, the nose case housed a complex propeller reduction gear that incorporated control rotating drives and two speeds. The two-speed mechanism was hydraulically operated from the engine oil boosted to 300 PSI. Additionally, a five-piece steel forged crankcase supported the four-row, four-piece crankshaft. The crank itself was supported in five roller bearings, and its single-stage, single-speed supercharger was supplemented by dual turbochargers. Lycoming loved to mention in their publicity with this engine that it burned enough fuel in an hour to run the average family automobile for one year, and at 580 gallons an hour, they probably weren't far off. The oil flow was also a whopping 71 gallons a minute. Its power rating for its weight was, perhaps unsurprisingly, not so great, only generating 5,000 horsepower for its massive 6,050 pounds. The reason for all this size was that the engine was intended to be fitted into a B36. However, due to political reasons, the B36 was instead powered by R4360s. As such, early B36s were grossly underpowered and soon needed modification to include four J47 jets. Don't let the relatively small displacement number fool you. When the Wright Corporation designed the R2160, they definitely intended to break the mold. In fact, the R2160 ranks as one of the most complex aircraft piston engines ever attempted. So much so that its complexity became its downfall. You see, what was interesting about the R2160 was that hidden in that displacement number were 42 cylinders, with a four and a quarter inch bore and a 3.625 inch stroke. Designed on 14 cylinder modules, of which three were used, the company also had developed plans to create a 70 cylinder model made from five modules. Overall, the engine had good design characteristics, however, the engine was liquid cooled, which was not Wright Aeronautical's area of expertise. With six cylinders per row and seven total rows, each cylinder bank was a monoblock construction. Two valve hemispherical combustion chambers and overhead camshafts were part of the cylinder head design. As this was a high-speed engine, the propeller reduction gearing was also overly complex, with seven pinions, each one driven from the cylinder head of a cylinder row, which drove the reduction gear through a lay shaft. The crankcase design was nine bolted-together steel forgings, and a built-up crankshaft allowed the use of one-piece master rods with six articulating rods attached. All crankshaft bearings were plain. For takeoff, the R2160 was rated at 2,350 horsepower at 4,145 RPM, with a weight of just 2,400 pounds, which met the one horsepower per cubic inch goal. In the mid-1930s, the same sleeve valve that gave rise to the Napier Saver brought on by the influence of Harry Ricardo and Roy Fedden caused George Meade to believe liquid-cooled sleeve valve technology was the wave of the future. When Meade returned from his visit to England, he signed a contract with the U.S. Navy for an 1,800-horsepower engine, which would be called the X-1800. Conceptually, it was very similar to the Sabre as it was a liquid-cooled 25-cylinder H configuration. However, soon Meade's health deteriorated, and he was forced to run the X-1800 program from his home. But soon after, as Meade resigned from Pratt & Whitney, Luke Hobbs, who took over the program, canceled it as the Air Corps became interested in the R-4360 instead. Additionally, the H-3730, which was a Navy request for an outgrowth of the X-1800 program, continued through 1943, but it too was also eventually canceled. The H-3730 being canceled was delayed because in the early 1940s, Pratt & Whitney had no other engines in the 3,000 horsepower category, and the development of the R-4360 was still in its infancy. So, the dream of an American sleeve valve engine died, but considering the issues Napier had dealt with to get their engine running properly, there was probably little chance they would have completed the engine prior to the end of the war. So, what can we learn looking back on these hyper engines? Well, as history shows us, timing is everything. While some of these engines had impressive performance and designs, all of them shared a singular flaw. 
Their manufacturers attempted to design, engineer, and produce a completely revolutionary design in the midst of a war. As we've seen throughout history, the engineering cycles of these engines that would be successful were already nearly completed by the end of the 1930s, and their respective horsepower races were won through iteration and improvement rather than redesigning them entirely. Had many of these contenders had more time or different circumstances, their promise might have yet been fulfilled. But while engineers were dealing with ironing out various fatigue issues and optimizing their forced induction systems, more traditional engines, such as the Pratt & Whitney Radials and the Rolls-Royce V engines, were already making history. If you liked today's video, don't forget to like and subscribe. We're still trying to build a bigger viewership, so if you could shoot us a subscription, that would be great. As always, thank you for tuning in to Flight Dojo. We'll see you next time.